Joining me now, Jordan Trimble, the president and CEO at Sky Harbor Resources. Hello, Jordan. Good to see you again. Good to see you as well. Happy to be here. Good. So we're going to t take a big, broad look at the sector, and, and you'll drill down a little bit for us as well. But uh, David Talbot, uh, Red Cloud's head of research, recently updated his uh, uranium outlook. Mm -hmm. uh, and a number of uh, factors that he looked at in terms of tailwinds are uh, everything from government policies, more public accept acceptance, better economics, climate change impacts, and also the importance of security of supply. So what stands out to you there as, as you put it all together? Well, yeah, look, I think Tal Dave does an excellent job um, summarizing this kind of myriad of reasons why nuclear uh, is, is um, coming back in vogue here. And, um, you know, starting with government policies uh, and uh, legislation, I mean, look, both uh, most countries in the West um, have either pivot completely pivoted from a, a, a nuclear phase out, uh, or have doubled down on their nuclear civilian nuclear expansion programs. And then you know you have countries in the developing world that recognize the uh, undeniable benefits of nuclear as the only clean, baseload, emissions-free, affordable, reliable, scalable electricity generation. And so we're seeing um, throughout the world. Uh, this push uh, by most governments um, that have uh, nuclear programs to, um, you know, advance those nuclear programs and foster um, uh, and build the industry out. There's, uh, you know, a dozen or so bills uh, being passed in the U.S. Uh, Congress right now that'll be advantageous for for nuclear their nuclear industry in Canada. Here we're seeing um, a, a big push as well, and we've just seen in the last few years a, a billion dollar investment made by the Canadian Infrastructure Bank um, to build uh, the first uh, small modular reactor at the Darlington plant here in Ontario. Um, we're seeing most of uh, the European nations um, uh, continue to grow their nuclear industries, uh, whether it be France, the UK, uh, the, some of the Scandinavian countries. Um, so it's a very exciting time. And, and yeah, look, um, you know, as I said earlier, nuclear, when it comes to decarbonization, right, nuclear is has to play an integral role uh, in in that um, going forward. We saw at the COP28 um, conference in December in Dubai, um, over 20 countries sign a pledge to triple nuclear capacity. Uh, and so uh, there's uh, the decarbonization, the, the climate change um, factor that's, that's benefiting uh, the, the nuclear industry as well. And then when we look at uh, energy independence and, and security of supply, obviously with the war in Russia, Ukraine, uh, you know, we saw uh, the ramifications of that for energy, especially in Europe, uh, countries that are, are heavily reliant on fossil fuels from places like Russia uh, got hit pretty hard. And uh, nuclear energy has always uh, been a source of electricity that allows company uh, countries to be uh, energy independent, right? And so I think we'll continue to see that uh, countries um, reverting to uh, the, this source of clean electricity uh, to prevent the reliance on uh, s uh, foreign supplies of fossil fuels for their energy needs. Now, the World Nuclear Association estimates uh, a, Europe, a uranium uh, deficit this year and next of about uh, uh, 54 million pounds and then out to uh, 2033 as much as 400 million pounds. So is that jibe with your internal numbers at Sky Harbor? Yeah, I mean, look, the the the, the numbers are um, right now that we're seeing um, estimated for 2024, the demand side about 195 to 200 million pounds of, of annual demand and growing quicker. Um, that's important, right? A couple of years ago, the, the average uh, uh, yearly growth rate was about two and a half, 2.6 percent. We've now seen that bump up, move up to just under 4% uh, in terms of uh, uranium demand as uh, fuel in nuclear power generation. So call it 100 and total uh, demand is about 195 to 200 million pounds. Primary mine supply though uh, is about 150 to 160 million pounds. And look, the supply side has been the big question mark. Um, the demand side's been durable, it's been growing, uh, but the, 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 uh, the supply side's been the big, big uh, question here over the last few years. We've seen uh, the two largest producers, Kazatomprom and Cameco, announced production cuts recently. In particular, Kazatomprom, pretty meaningful production cuts for 2024 and likely for 2025. Um, so you have a major supply uh, deficit, structural supply deficit to the tune of, yeah, 40 to 60 million pounds, depending on how you model it. And the big thing now is we just simply do not have the secondary supplies that were able to plug that 
supply gap, this age of uh, abundance of secondary supplies that we've seen has, com has come to a, a, a screeching halt here. And uh, as a result of that, this supply deficit that's uh, in the market currently is leading to upward pressure on the uranium price. Now, speaking of demand, uh, in his report, Talbot argues, uh, David argues, that uh, the current price adjusted for inflation is really only half of what it was around 06, 07, or the 07 peak. And also the difference this time is that there's real demand uh, compared to uh, less so speculation, which was got quite frothy back then. Yeah, absolutely. And, and you know, going back to that other number that you pulled out, the 400 uh, million pounds of cumulative supply deficit um, by 2033, just for some compa uh, comparison, back in 06, 07, there was actually a cumulative surplus uh, going into 06, 07 of a couple hundred million pounds. So there's a, a number of differentiating um, uh, qualities and, 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 and characteristics with this market versus what we saw, call it 15 uh, years ago, 16 years ago. And uh, it's going to make for a very interesting um, next few years is I think that this market, uh, this bull market is going to be much more sustained. It's going to be longer term. Um, you, obviously, you know, the fundamentals are, are, are showing us that the underlying fundamentals are showing that there's, uh, I think, going to be much higher prices. Um, there's a good case to be had for higher prices. When we look at it historically, Historically, the price of uranium um, in inflation adjusted terms, yes, in the mid 90s here, it's, it's less than half. Uh, of where it has been uh, historically, 06, 07, and also in the mid 70s as well. It, the 70s though, you had a lot more uh, supply uh, at that point relative to the annual demand. And so again, the underlying fundamentals today compared to where they have been and the price today compared to where it has been on, in inflation adjusted terms uh, is, is, is very compelling uh, for I think investors and companies in the space. Speaking of price, uh, in his report, David uh, is uh, expecting an average of 120 per pound this year, and then going out to 27, 175 a pound again. Is that kind of similar to what you're looking at? Well, I, I'll, I'll, leave, <laughs> I'll leave the, the price pr uh, projection to, to Dave and, and, and other analysts. But yeah, look, I think, you know, as we said, uh, in inflation adjusted terms, we've seen it trade uh, as high as uh, over $200 a pound a couple times historically. Um, uh, you know, we typically do see this commodity overshoot when it's in these bull markets, it has these very quick uh, moves higher. We've seen that historically, and there's a number of reasons for that. Um, you know, a big part of um, these these bull markets and just the, the lofty prices that you can ultimately see, um, part of that has to do with the fact that the end buyer, the end user being a nuclear utility is less price sensitive. Um, as prices increase, um, there isn't as much demand destruction as, you, as there would be with other commodities. And the reason for that is uh, simple. The, the cost of operating a reactor, the fuel cost is a relative relatively small amount of the total cost of, of that reactor. So there's some un unique um, characteristics with this market um, and this commodity that would allow for these much higher prices. And uh, yeah, we'll, we'll see how uh, things play out. But I think importantly here, um, we, we want to we see a much more sustained bull market and higher prices. I think that that's a key thing. And I think we will see that versus what we saw, for example, in 06, 07, where it was really kind of a blow off top situation and then it pulled back uh, shortly thereafter. Right, you just have to look at that chart. It did eventually just kind of go straight up. Now, in terms of this bull market for uranium stocks, producers led the way originally, which is kind of to be expected. But then um, developers and explorers caught up. Your stock's done quite well. We're seeing a bit of a consolidation currently. So what, what's your What's your gauge right now of investor sentiment? Yeah, I mean, there's, you know, there has been a pullback in recent weeks. I think that the, the bottom is in on that pullback. We've seen these pullbacks over the last few years, as you and I were talking about. Nothing goes straight up. Um, I think they're healthy pullbacks. Um, I think it kind of flushes out. Um, well, there's some profit taking, but then it also flushes out you know, hot money, that's fast money that's come in looking for a quick trade. Um, and so, it, you know, as long as we're seeing, you know, higher lows and, and we have been seeing that and and then, you know, ultimately as the market continues to heat up, um, you, you know, there will be much like we've seen also um, where you get these, you know, month, two month, three month periods where, you know, a lot of money comes into the space and, and um, obviously the uranium price is probably moving higher, but you see the equities really have, um, you know, a, a, a quick, big move higher as well. I mean, if we look at, um, you know, the historicals on, on the pricing of these, um, uh, of these equities of the uranium mining stocks, if you look at, for example, 
03 to 07, right? In, in that bull market, that run up. Um, it was interesting in terms of what performed well and when. And so we saw Cameco perform very well in the first few years from 03 to 06. It was up about 700%. The junior companies, the, the, the uh, bottom 50th percentile, the smaller cap companies, they were up about 400% in that same time period. Now those junior companies ended up over the 06, 07 period, ended up moving upwards of, uh, on average 1200%. Mm. Uh, Cameco finished at about 800% mm. up from the 03 lows. And so um, that's not unusual. You typically see the smaller and mid cap names outperform later in the cycle. I think we have yet to see that play out. And that's, all, that's I think also a good um, barometer as to where we are in the cycle. We haven't yet seen um, a lot of the kind of widespread rising tide with the junior and smaller cap names. It is working its way down, uh, but I think we have to see that yet play out. Okay, great stuff. Uh, lastly, uh, just in terms of Sky Harbor and, and where you sit in this landscape that you've been discussing, short term and, and, and longer term opportunities. Yeah, look, we've positioned the company over um, uh, the last decade um, uh, to you know be a, a major exploration player, a leading exploration company uh, in the Athabasca Basin. Um, you know, the first few years um, uh, that we started the company, it was a very challenging uranium market and mining market that afforded us the opportunity to start building up the asset base. We now have 29 projects, the third largest mineral tenure holding in Northern Saskatchewan with over 1.45 million acres. Um, across those 29 projects, we have a very uh, dynamic business model. We're focused on new high grade discoveries uh, and resource expansion at our two main co-flagship Russell and Moore Lake projects. We have a 8,000 meter winter program, combined winter program going on currently. Uh, and we are planning additional drilling later in the year, fully funded, uh, fully permitted for all that work at those two main projects. But then we have, as you know, our prospect generator business, uh, seven partner companies currently, three of those are now uh, joint ventures, uh, four of them are still actively earning in and we're expecting um, five of those partner companies to be drilling and carrying out exploration programs throughout the course of this year and they have to fund the bulk of, uh, of the budgets for those programs. So we're in a great position to uh, deliver uh, high grade exploration success, continue to execute on a prospect generator business, continue to build up the project portfolio, short term look for uh, drill results uh, at our main projects, Russell and more, as well as partner funded uh, programs and uh, those partner funded projects. We have, we're working on a resource estimate at our Moore Lake project as well. Um, look for additional new partners uh, as well to come in on. We've got a couple dozen other 100% projects that we're uh, getting a lot of inbound interest uh, on uh, currently. Um, and then, you know, in the mid to long term, um, look, ultimately our goal for Sky Harbor, uh, hopefully after um, a lot of exploration success and a continued uh, move in the uranium price, uh, we, you know, we're looking for some type of corporate transaction exit strategy um, and, uh, and, and, and hopefully at a much, much higher valuation. All right. Excellent, Jordan. Uh, we'll be keenly watching the news flow, and I'm sure investors will too. Thanks a lot. Thank you. All right. Uh, Jordan Trimble, President and CEO of Sky Harbor Resources.